Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Lindsay Horvath. I have the honor and pleasure of serving as your mayor here in the city of West Hollywood. Um, it's uh, my absolute delight to welcome you all this evening to uh, what will be a wonderful event. I am just so, so humbled to be joined by such fierce and fearless and fabulous panelists um, who will be uh, hosting tonight's uh, conversation of disclosure. Um, I wanna thank my colleague, Council Member John Erickson for uh, making this panel discussion happen, leading the way and uh, allowing us all to say yes to this really great idea and uh, this wonderful evening. Uh, thank, a special thanks also to Bonnie Abanza who has been such a dear friend to the city of West Hollywood and uh, worked with Councilmember Erickson uh, to bring everyone together uh, for this uh, very important discussion. I know when uh, disclosure uh, first, I, I, I guess in the old way we would say first aired, but now it's you know streamed, so first became available. Um, I, I think uh, I, I was just so excited. Um, I had my own private premiere event at home, and um, and I think uh, if you haven't yet seen disclosure, what are you waiting for? For. Um, uh, this is uh, this is absolute uh, must see viewing, uh, not only because it's um, absolutely entertaining, but completely enriching in every sense of the word uh, for our community, uh, for an overall education and for a community conversation that will hopefully lead uh, to cult important cultural change. And I know all of our panelists tonight have been significant players uh, in doing exactly that. Uh, that's why it is my honor tonight to present on behalf of the city of West Hollywood, a proclamation for disclosure. I have it here oh. and I will share with you. Um, and each of you uh, will get your own separate uh, certificates of recognition. We will make sure that you're able to receive these. Um, it's kind of hard to put everything on display while also being in my kitchen. Welcome to my <laughs> home. Um, <laughs> but uh, these, are, these are the things that we do now in this virtual world of ours. Um, but I, I, I will share with you what our proclamation here from the city says, it reads, whereas disclosure is an unprecedented eye-opening look at transgender depictions in film and television, revealing how Hollywood simultaneously reflects and manufactures our deepest anxieties about gender. And whereas leading trans thinkers and creatives, including Laverne Cox, Lily Wachowski, Yance Ford, MJ Rodriguez, Jamie Clayton, and Chaz Bono share their reactions and resistance to some of, the, of Hollywood's most beloved moments, tracing a history that is at once dehumanizing, yet also evolving, complex, and sometimes humorous, and whereas Disclosure, directed by Sam, Sam Fetter, joined here with us tonight and produced by Amy Shoulder, highlights a fascinating story of dynamic interplay between trans rep representation on screen, society's beliefs, and the reality of trans lives. And whereas in recent years, there have been increasing visibility of transgender people and their representation in films and television, which signals a positive social change. However, violence against trans people and gender non-conforming people persists, including efforts to constrain transgender civil rights. And whereas disclosure shows audiences that decades old stereotypes, memes and tropes in the media both form and reflect our understanding of trans issues and they have shaped the cultural narrative about transgender people, informing everything from dating and domestic violence to school policy and national legislation. And whereas the city of West Hollywood has demonstrated a firm commitment to the provision and protection of human rights for all members of the community, including and especially trans and gender non-conforming community members. And whereas the mission of the city's human rights speaker series is to bring together diverse communities to learn about and discuss global, national and local human rights issues in a supportive environment, Therefore, be it resolved that the City Council of the City of West Hollywood hereby recognizes the entire team behind the film Disclosure and applauds the filmmakers for bringing attention to transgender representation in Hollywood. Signed by all of our council members, myself, uh, Council Member Erickson, Mayor Pro Tem Lauren Meister, Council Member John D'Amico, and Council Member Seppi Shine. Uh, we love and appreciate you all. Uh, we celebrate and, uh, and just honor the work that you do each and every day. Uh, thank you for being with us this evening. Thank you for the work that you'll continue to do and for sharing this wonderful and beautiful gift with all of us. We really, really appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
And now I will turn it over to Councilmember John Erickson. Thank you so much, Madam Mayor. It, welcome everybody. Welcome to the Human Rights Speaker Series. Uh, normally we would all be together in the council chambers having this conversation. We'll be back, um, but it is wonderful to be here with you all today. We have an amazing panel. Um, some amazing topics to cover and a film that in my opinion should win the best Oscar for documentary, Disclosure, um, but we're gonna get into that in just a little moment. Um, uh, my name is John Erickson. I use he, him, his pronouns. Um, I have the great honor of serving as a council member to the city of West Hollywood. Um, I am going to go through and intro our panelists and then we're gonna kick off the event. Um, we will have time at the end for questions and answers. If you have a question, um, because we're in this world of Zoom and I can't get past note cards like I normally would. If you wanna go ahead and email arts at weho.org, um, they'll be shooting me over the questions as we get them and we'll have time at the end for that. Um, and we're gonna get started right now. So first and foremost, I want to introduce um, the director of the film, Sam Fetter. Um, Sam is cited by IndieWire as an exciting trans filmmaker shaking up Hollywood. Sam's work explores the power dynamics and politics of media-driven identity, connecting urgent issues in the trans community to the struggles of the past. The advocate named Sam's feature, Kate Bornstein, is a queer and pleasant danger. Um, one of the best LGBTQ documentaries of 2014, Fetter's work has been reported by the Ford Foundation, Fork Films, at the Jerome Foundation, the McDonald Colony, and Yado. Um, welcome, Sam. It is so great to be here with you. Um, and thank you for helping put this film out together. I'm really excited. Next, um, and while I never thought I would be uh, uh, doing a Q&A with um, Laverne Cox from my bedroom with my dog right behind me, um, nevertheless, here we are. Um, but I want to welcome Laverne Cox, who's an executive producer. Um, Laverne, um, with various firsts in her already impressive career, Laverne Cox is a four-time Emmy-nominated actress, Emmy-winning producer, and a prominent equal rights advocate and public speaker. Laverne's groundbreaking role of Sophia Bursette in the critically acclaimed Netflix, Netflix original series, Orange is the New Black, brought her to the attention of diverse audiences all over the world. This role led to Laverne becoming the first openly transgender actress to be nominated for a primetime Emmy and made her the first trans woman of color to have a leading role on a mainstream, mainstream scripted television series. Laverne is continuing to expand her presence on the big and small screen with diverse and groundbreaking roles. She is currently in production on Shonda Rhimes' 10 episode limited series, Inventing Anna, already gonna be in my queue, I can tell you that much for Netflix. Um, she recently appeared in the romantic comedy, Can You Keep a Secret with Alexandra Daudio. Um, Laverne's upcoming films include Justin Simeon's independent film, Bad Hair, Focus feature and Film Nation Entertainment's thriller, Promising Young Woman, and the action comedy Jolt, alongside Kate Beckinsale, Bobby Cavanell, and Stanley Tucci. Laverne's uh, Emmy winning documentary, Laverne Cox Presents the T Word, led her to the executive produce two more powerful documentaries. Free CC and Disclosure. Free CC tells the story of CC McDonald, a transgender woman who was controversially sentenced to 41 months in a men's prison for second degree manslaughter after defending herself against a racist and transphobic attack. Disclosure, currently streaming on Netflix, is an unprecedented groundbreaking look at the depiction of transgender characters throughout the history of film and television, one we're gonna talk about tonight. Welcome Laverne, it's so wonderful to have you here. Um, Thank you. Sir. Wonderful. Um, next, we have Alexis Sanchez, um, a Los Angeles native. Alexis got her start in activism in 2016 after the Pulse nightclub shooting. She participated in a project that went across the country to cite different gun related uh, hate crimes and culminated in a rally for common sense gun reform and increased hate crime protections for the LGBTQ community. After visiting the spot where, the tra uh, where a transgender woman of color was murdered, she decided to dedicate her life to bettering the lives of the transgender community and pursuing 
policy changes that will help to bring more opportunities to trans individuals, especially trans women of color. She currently works in the public policy and serves on the city of West Hollywood's transgender advisory board as her vice chair. Um, she spends the bulk of her free time trying to improve her community through volunteering, community organizing, uh, and media advocacy to help normalize trans individuals. Alexis was also named the Woman of the Year for 2020 by Representative Adam Schiff, and I am currently the secretary of her fan club. Memberships are available after the show. Um, last but certainly not least, we have Drian Juarez, um, who is a global consultant on diversity and inclusion and is the vice president of programming for Trans Can Work. She works to build inclusive community cultures where gender diverse people can thrive. She has served as the global partnerships manager for Grindr, uh, Grindr's Grindr for Good, um, and has uh, served where she's promoted their health, equity, justice, and um, global um, advocacy for the LGBTQIA community. She is the founder and former program manager for the LA LGBT Center's Transgender Economic Empowerment Project um, and building a solid foundation for TEEP. Um, Juarez established uh, cross-organizational, cross-functional teams to assist in the mission of developing um, substantive employment and business opportunities for Los Angeles transgender community members. Uh, Drianne has also served in a whole host of roles, um, additionally on our Transgender Advisory Board, um, and, and I am very honored to call her a personal friend. I um, want to welcome everyone. Um, we've got a lot of great stuff to talk about. We're going to get into it right away. Um, I'm going to ask the first question to you, Sam. Um, as I've already given out the spoiler alert, I think I know who I'm rooting for for the Oscar this year. Um, but what has been the industry reception to this film? I know it's not only groundbreaking, but it is receiving great reviews. And I would love for you to talk a little bit about that. Thank you, first off, for having us, for hosting this. Thank you to all of you. Um, and you know, thank you for, for saying that about the Oscar. Obviously, you know, what filmmaker wouldn't want that? Um, you know, and a nomination is not just about this one film, right? It actually would be about acknowledging a century of distorted images, right? And decades of anti-trans national policy. And it would signal to the world that trans people are seen for who we are, right? That we're real and that we deserve to be part of public space and discourse. And so more than, you know, my filmmaker dream, I feel really passionate about what, what that could do. Even, you know, we're, we're still far away from the actual Oscars, you know, the, but the shortlist is happening the next week and a half. And so even to get shortlisted, I feel like that, that support from the industry would be incredibly meaningful to a lot of trans people. Um, so thank you for your support <laughs> in that. Um, in terms of the reaction in the industry, was that your question? Yeah. Oh my God, it happened so quickly. I, I, I never imagined how quickly it would happen. Within days, you know, we're, we were hearing from, first off, I think the people that heard it first were the people in the film, right? The, the talent in the film, our, 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 our cast, um, that were getting messages from their agents, from their managers, from other casting agents. Like, have you seen this? Oh my God, this changes everything. And then we'd start to hear from celebrities. Like I think Laverne and Jen Richards both heard from Ryan Reynolds. And that was really flattering. <laughs> and I think he said something along the lines, Laverne, maybe please correct me if I'm wrong, but something along the lines of like, he will never look at film and TV the same again, and he will never make film and TV the same way again. And a few months later, he started his own fellowship program. So that, that was incredible, right? To see it reaching people who, who can make a difference in the industry. Um, I think Charlize Theron, <laughs> you know, posted a something about it, you know, um, and just in support of it, uh, it was during Pride. So it was really lovely to see people come out in, and having this be a moment um, to kind of guide us through Pride. That was incredible. Um, Haley Berry, I think she was up for a role uh, as a trans guy in a film. I think it was in the fall. And within... I think our, when our team got word of it, they kind of got, people got in touch with her team and suggested watching Disclosure and within 48 hours, she walked away from the role. So it's having a huge impact. It's, I think what's so exciting about using film and TV, mainstream film and TV, is it, it, it creates this bridge that didn't exist before, right? Here is this common language and common experience uh, that we've all taken in for decades. 
And I think that's allowing us to have conversations that we were just kind of hitting walls about in the past. Laverne, I want to toss it over to you on this question as well. I mean, you've, you've been in the industry, you've, you've experienced so much. Um, what, what has the reaction been like for you um, as, a, as an executive producer and actress and all that you've been able to experience since the uh, uh, premiere, if we call it that, on Netflix since the film came out? So much. Thank you for having us. Um, we're really honored to be here. Uh, so much of my career, my public life has been about um, highlighting the, the beautiful humanity of trans people and disclosure feels like the culmination of, of, of a way of lifetime of work. And I'm so grateful um, to Sam and his vision for allowing me to be a part of this project. Um, I, you know, it's wild. I think about, you know, Tracy Ellis Ross um, just randomly, you know, was talking on an excuse being interviewed for about another project. And she was just like, have you seen Disclosure? And then um, she sent me a really sweet message privately. I haven't told anybody this. She, the sweetest message that she was just so incredibly moved by the by the work and other folks in the industry as well, um, Sam Mish and Charlize and um, Nicole Kidman. And so the hope is that, 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 that yes, they've been moved and then and, and going forward um, that the humanity of trans people will be something that we are aware of, but then like, what does it mean to hire trans people to play trans characters and non-trans characters? What does it mean to hire trans folks behind the scenes as well? And just, and have, and I think what's so exciting about um, Sam's sort of production model, um, you know, we, he, Sam is committed to making sure that we hire trans people for every um, role a, a, on the crew um, behind the scenes. And when we couldn't find someone trans, we um, hired someone, um, we had the non-trans person um, sort of train the trans, uh, a trans fellow. And we had this fellowship program where everyone was paid. And it's a beautiful template to, you know, we talk a lot about diversity in this business, but I think this template gives us a, a way to begin to cultivate talent from various backgrounds in, the, in this business. And so it is something that I hope will inspire other filmmakers um, to bring in um, new talent um, and have people who are, um, who are reflected in the storytelling tell the story as well. That's such a great way to say it. And you know, one theme that I got when I was rewatching the film this morning is that if you can't see it, how can you dream of becoming it? And, and the ways in which we talk about um, uh, not only the forward facing um, representations in film, the people in front of the camera, but Laverne and Sam, you talk about the behind the scenes aspect of the camera. We're going to get more on that in a second because I really think that's a great model that everyone should employ. But I want to toss this same question over to Drian and Alexis, um, being activist rabble rousers and community members um, and how they've seen this film and, and potentially what has this had on your life and within your community? Um, Maybe Drian, you can start um, and then we'll go over to Alexis. Yeah, thank you. And, um, you know, for me personally, just watching Disclosure, it just felt like a revolution to me because of the impact that those shows had on me as a kid and, and not even recognizing the misogyny um, and just the horribleness that was portrayed in many of those shows. And just as a kid, recognizing something that connected and resonated with me. Um, and so, uh, you know, it really made me reflect on the power of media um, and how it's shaped so much of how we've seen ourselves and how others see us. Um, and now, you know, taking uh, to a certain extent control of that um, and really shaping that narrative, I think is so powerful. And I, it inspires me to think of the kids who are going to grow up seeing these stories, getting to have these conversations and how as a kid, that would have just changed my life. And so, um, you know, for me, the impact is just so incredibly proud and happy that these stories were out and the honesty by which so many, you know, activists were sharing the impact that that, that media had on them. It was just transformative. Um, and, you know, for the work that, that I do at uh, Trans Can Work, we've seen so many more production companies um, come to us and want to get training. Uh, and we see it, you know, really trickle into all levels of media companies. So it's not just hiring staff, but also thinking about HR systems, making sure that their insurances are inclusive. Um, and also from content creators 
we've been doing a lot more trainings with writers and producers who want to make sure that they do right by these stories. Um, and, you know, I think this is the impact of, of movies like Disclosure that really, you know, speak to the importance of authenticity and how that can't just be something you see on screen that really has to resonate throughout the whole entire production of the, the film. And so, you know, for us, we see it create so many more opportunities for trans people to be able to get into the industry uh, and to really have hope and possibility that they can see that there are careers for them in these spaces that they really didn't even conceive of before. And so it, it's just been such a profound impact. Alexis? Yeah, I just want to echo what everyone else has been saying. It's first off, it's an honor to be here. Um, and it's been really great to watch this film, to watch the whole process. I know I have several films who worked, or several friends who worked on the film, and seeing the excitement and knowing that this film is going to be one of their first major credits that's hopefully going to allow them to get just bigger roles and bigger opportunities and be that springboard into a really, really great career. Um, so watching that aspect of, of it has been really great. But I think for me, one of the most powerful things um, among the many hats I wear, I do social impact consulting. So I work with media companies to help refine their marketing campaigns to hopefully affect change um, in terms of any social issue. And prior to this film, it really was having those like painfully connect dots with executives and really explain like the root of transphobia goes back really, really far. And I have to pull up slides of, you know, just all the terrible dis depictions of trans people in media and how that leads to hate crimes and how that leads to us being excluded from workplaces and housing. And uh, I, you know, like now there's a central repository that hopefully will be very, um, you know, hopefully there will be a future Oscar <laughs> nominated or Oscar winning documentary that we can say, like this really spells out what the challenges that the community faces are. And this is what you as a corporation can do to start to move the needle on that. So Sam, it's really clear to so many of us that this is just such a work of love. I mean, there is just, you feel it. And I wanna say thank you because I've been missing our community. I've been missing um, being together. And when I watched it, I got this sense that like I was just surrounded by my closest friends and people that I love the most. But I know that in all works of love, you know, you can't have a 30 hour epic. I mean, we all, you know, have what we have here. I know it's really hard to take things away, but I know you researched, you edited it. How did you, you know, and what did you decide that went in this film um, and, you know, the research behind it, but what got left on the cutting room floor at the end of the day? And how did you present the image that you ended up presenting? Mm, that's such a great question. Thank you. Um, don't get to talk about that enough. And that's kind of the fun, you know, behind the scenes, like detail stuff I love to think about. You know, the, the research was so uh, interesting. It, it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. I thought I, I decided to make this film and I thought there'd be a book on the history of trans representation, right? Like Cellulite Closet was based on Theodore Rousseau's tome and Ethnic Notions was based on a book about the history of representation of black people in film and TV. So I thought, okay, I just need to find my book and there's no book. So that was a, a, common, a moment of, okay, I, I'm gonna have to do this research and that's really scary, right? I, I, I'm not a trained historian, I'm not a trained researcher. Um, and also we know historically that and documenting history is a very ethically precarious thing to do. So before I even started doing my own archival dig or going to the libraries or going to museums, I traveled around the country and spoke with as many trans people as I could who worked on one side of the camera or the other and collected memories and their ideas and their perspectives. And that's how we started the database. And then from there, we built a database of over 600 television titles and 400 film titles. And then, you know, in making the film, you know, the goal, right, was to reach individuals as they're viewing and take them through a process so that maybe they would leave the film changed, right? They would confront some of their biases, some things they had internalized, whether they're trans or not, right? Start to look at all this time, decades of information that they've perhaps passively ingested and start to actively interrogate it and, and hope that 
you you find yourself laughing at a joke and then you actually now understand why maybe you shouldn't laugh. And not just because it's politically incorrect, but because it really hurts people, right? So to have that, to see that growth, and I felt like the way to achieve that sort of transformation in the viewer, we needed to, to watch the film through this sort of, this lens of memory, right? And, and meet people and start to understand their experiences and, and kind of move through time and have time fold in on itself. So it wasn't chronological, it wasn't thematic, it was really following how people experienced these different memories and their reactions to it and then that leading to another memory. So that's kind of, that was our approach to the structure. You know, obviously with 600 television clips and 400 film clips, there was so much that didn't make it into the film. And there's so many people that didn't make it into the film and there's so many topics that didn't make it in the film. You know, but one thing that I'm still looking for that I couldn't find um, is this clip of Christine Jorgensen on the Dick Cavett show. And on the Dick, right, Laverne, we talked about this and I called different museums, I tried to find it. And the Dick Cavett website has clips of pretty much every show over the decades, but this clip doesn't exist anymore. Mm. And it's because, and, and this completely ties to like the legacy that Laverne has left us with when it comes to talk shows, is at one point in the show, Dick Cavett asked her a, a question about surgery in her body. And she just looked at him and said, I'm not answering that. And she walked off the stage. And for the rest of the show, he apologized, right? But that doesn't exist anymore. They, they, we don't know about that, right? So it took until, what was it, Laverne, 2015, when you were on Katie Couric, and that's in Disclosure, when Laverne finally was able to shut down that conversation, right? And, and Katie was such a model, right, of accountability and, and, and apology and doing it better, right? They, and she invited Laverne back on to talk about how do we actually have these conversations so I, I would have loved to have been able to bookend that scene where we have Laverne uh, and Katie and have that show that this has been something we have been asking for for decades. Um, like this is not something that the media just started doing. Like this has been happening for you know 50 years. Um, so that's a clip that I'm still looking for. Um, yeah. That's such a great uh, caveat. And you must be reading my mind, Sam, because I was gonna talk about the power of media and Laverne, that is such a moment that really stuck with me, I think, throughout the entire film. I mean, there's so much, but, um, you know, the power of media and the role that it has to educate, but also shape. And you, I have such, I have respect for you in so many ways, but the way in which you tackle this issue uh, head on, you know, and it, it happens right before the clip when we talk about Candace Kane's uh, depiction on Dirty Sexy Money, where the studio execs, you know, they're praising themselves for having uh, an, a transgender actress on the show and what they're doing, but then they lowered her octave in the back end of her voice. Um, so she appeared trans, which is a whole nother topic of itself with what that, what that does. But then it, uh, then it, uh, bookmarks itself over to the conversation that you had with Laverne, Co um, with that you had with uh, Katie Couric. And I would love for you to talk a little bit about that because you use media in such a way that just helps push this message of tolerance, love, acceptance, but ultimately accountability. And I would love to know how you do that um, uh, and, and do it with such grace, as I must say. Thank you for that. I, 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 it feels like it's been very imperfect and messy at times, um, living it and being in it. But what it's so beautiful. I mean, Sam said it already about, I, I think Katie Kirk is a wonderful model of what accountability looks like, if, of what, when, what can happen when we don't call people out, but it, call them, invite them in. And um, when folks are interested in being teachable, I... Um, I remember after the um, we did the sh the show aired with Katie and I ran into her at an event and we um, sort of went over into a corner and we had, and we had a heart to heart and she um, just said she appreciated how much love I had for her because she she got she got some she, people were very not so nice online after that happened and again to her credit for you know taking all of that incoming but she really appreciated the love and empathy that I had for her and you know we had a lovely conversation then I went back on her show many months later we had um, Chase Strangio who's now a dear friend on the show and we talked about issues that affect trans people and violence against trans folks and we had a real we she was like if we're not 
supposed to ask about body parts and surgery, then what should we be talking about? And then she, and she even went on to make a documentary of her own called Gender Revolution a few years later that I didn't even know about. And so, so it's just, she has become this wonderful advocate for the community. And I think that she, it's a wonderful model of what can happen when someone, um, has love in their heart and wants to do the, do the right thing, you know, and, and has the best of intentions, but might not get something exactly right, but then is accountable for that. And, um, and is also approached with love, with a lot of love and empathy. And so, I don't know, I, that's one of the highlights of my, you know, career, I think so far that moment with Katie. And it, I think it definitely changed a lot of, and that, that moment happened this is not just, you know, obviously shout out to Carmen Carrera, but it happened, I think a month after that, you know, Janet Mock was on the Pierce Morgan show. He had a show on CNN at the time and a similar line of questioning happened. So it was, it was Janet Mock. It was, it was Carmen Carrera. It was, it was a, it was a community of trans people who had been, you know, saying these things for years, for decades, who finally, because of social media had a voice that could be heard and, um, I'm just really grateful for that community and, um, and to this day. And there's still so much work to be done. I, I have to say, Alexis and Adrienne, I love hearing um, from you about the impact of this film on the work that you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, because that really is the work that has to continue to happen. And the, the, the trans people who are poor and working class and marginalized in so many different ways are still struggling. Like so many people are struggling in this, in this country and around the world right now because of this pandemic and people need help and people need um, access. And so um, I, I'm so grateful to the work that activists like you are doing on, on a day-to-day -day basis to uh, make the lives of trans people better. Thank you. It's yeah. such an important point to make as well, to talk about how we are centering these conversations on accountability and what we do. And I think if this past summer or um, all the work, uh, I think on true racial justice, but justice for all individuals and all bodies is done any, it, it, if we do it any justice that what we're doing is that it's, it's centering that it's okay to have this, um, this anger and this rage. And I know Alexis, we've spoken about this, but you know, in, in commenting and looking at the ways in which we still have a lot of work to do and the work that you do on a day-to-day -day basis on the ground, um, how has this film and the work that you've done changed maybe your approach to media and how you deal with uh, the people that you consult with? But um, when you're talking within your communities itself, um, being the vice chair of the City of West Hollywood's Transgender Advisory Board, how do you center not only accountability, but the the fact that it's okay to be angry when this stuff happens. And I think it's okay to be there, right? Um, but how we approach that, how we meet that and, and meet it with the love and light to move this world forward. Um, I would love to talk about that a little bit um, from your experience. Yeah, um, I think I love the fact that the film did it talked a lot about race, right? Because when you look at transphobia and trans, right, it's it's intertwined. It's this intersectional struggle. There's a reason that the life expectancy for Black transgender women is 35 years because they live at the intersection of racism, misogyny, and transphobia. And it's like, if you're not dismantling all three of those, you're not gonna be able to like really move the needle on any one of them. Um, seriously, but you know, I feel like, especially before this summer, a lot of people didn't see that. I think when you're cloaked in, when you have a certain amount of privilege, it's something that you don't have to think about really. Um, thankfully now we've moved forward to a place where people can, uh, are starting to see that and are starting to be a lot more receptive. I think the stories that media tells like helps to unpack that for people where they can start to have a little softness and not react hard, harshly to things. I think I know myself, when I first started doing activism, I started volunteering with, un with undocumented people. And until then, I hadn't really um, had my, priv my own privilege pushed up against. And it was something that was profoundly uncomfortable, right? When somebody challenged me and said, like, you know, you, you're a documented US citizen. You have access to things that we don't. And you won't understand what our struggle is like because of that. And when someone said that to me, I was like, ow. <laughs> That was not comfortable, um, but that was a moment for me to grow a little bit. So I would hope that with people watching this film, they can start to unpack some of that bias, unpack some of those narratives in a way that um, is maybe 
I mean, I hope that there is still a bit of discomfort because that's what forces us to change as people, as individuals, as a society. Um, but I hope that films and film, this film and films like it start to um, open people up a little bit more so we can start to have more productive conversations. It's so important. And I want to talk about how we move forward and specifically the way in which this film is centered, not only employment, but the ways in which you train, creative fellowships, the work that you do. And, and this centers on kind of the conversation we've started already. And, and I want to toss it over to Sam first to talk about the envisioning of this process, that it's not just putting something on film and in front of people, but it's everything that goes in behind the scenes and then talk uh, and then toss it over to Drian to really talk about the work that you do at Trans Can Work um, uh, and how that creating new positions, creating careers just lead to economic empowerment in a way um, to, that get us to a different level of equality. So Sam, I'll toss it over to you and anyone please join in on this qu question as well. It's for everyone. I mean, first off, I when, when I was realizing the, the potential of this film and the production value we were gonna have and, and, and the opportunities that, that we were gonna have our, when we were still a small team, you know, I immediately knew that we needed as many trans people as possible. Not only because trans people are so disproportionately underemployed, I think it's three times the national average, four times if you're a trans person of color, but also because you can't teach a lived experience. Right? And this film is about a lived experience. So you can't have someone on set that hasn't lived it, right? You can't, it just, it would be a different film. So we prioritized hiring trans people because every single role on set informed the final product. Because not only, you know, during breaks would we all check in and I would ask people if there was a question that didn't come up that they would want to ask, you know, that would happen all day long. Or on set, you know, we in, in front of the curtain, it was only trans people. And that intimacy that develops when you're in a knowing environment, when you know the people that are looking right at you understand where you're coming from and understand your references, and you feel there's a different safety. I mean, trans people are so often the only trans person in the room, right? So having trans people behind the camera where usually they're on set and they're constantly have their like trans warnings like on alert. They don't have to do that now. They can just focus on their job. And then the folks in front of the camera also knowing they can kind of let go of some of those worries, know an inappropriate question was not gonna come up, know that if something was painful, there would be people who understood that pain. Like, so that was, that is so part of, I, I think the intimacy that you see, that you feel when you watch the film, right? Um, so prioritize hiring trans people. But when we couldn't, because trans people have not given as much opportunity and experience and, and have been able to gain the skills out of choice or circumstance as non-trans people, we mentored a trans person. And that was, you know, I think one of the proudest parts of making this film. You know, again, we did a national search. I think I spoke to over 94 applicants. We flew in people from all around the country and they got their start on our set. And that is unbelievable. I mean, one of our from, you know, a P, one of our fellows sold his script for like a lot of money, <laughs> more money than I've ever made in this industry. Um, another one of our fellows is now a, a, a series regular on this HBO show called Generations. And, and between and in two years, I think she put out two shorts um, that screened around the world. Another one of our fellows won like two awards from Outfest two summers in a row. Like it just immediately we were seeing the impact. And I think so much of it is about also just the confidence you get when suddenly you're centered in a situation and you see that that's possible, that you don't always have to exist in fear and on the margins, right? So that, that was incredible. And, and one last thing I wanna share about, you know, prioritizing trans people on the set was one of our mentors, uh, this woman named Desi, she was, a non-trans person, so she was mentoring a trans person and she was so moved by this experience. And it occurred to her that IATSE, the largest tech union in the world where she was a member would not be the most welcoming place for a trans person. So back in January, 2018, on one of our, after one of our first shoots, she started conversations with IATSE about implementing a trans sensitivity training. And that has now been instituted across the country. So that behind the scenes invisible work is, is just makes this project all the more meaningful. 
That's so great. I mean, uh, Drian, tossing it over to you with the work that you center every day, you know, at, uh, at Trans Can Work. I mean, how has, you've talked about how this film has opened doors to, and you're seeing these calls now, but maybe speak a little bit more about, you know, this is the blueprint that we should all be using. Equality um, is good for the economy, right? <laughs> I mean, like how we make sure these opportunities are available. Um, could you talk a little bit more about that? Absolutely. And, you know, recognizing the value of diversity, you know, I think that's happening more and more. Um, but, you know, I think the, the thing that we're seeing is that we're seeing the Katie Couric's of the world come out in these environments, in these workplaces who, you know, feel a connection to these stories, who want to do good, who want to do this right, um, and who are willing to be vulnerable um, and I love what Laverne said about not calling out, but uh, a calling in. And that's what we see that people recognize that, you know, they haven't done it right. They don't really know how to do it right. And they're willing to be vulnerable enough to, to do it right. Even if it means, you know, correcting some of the wrong that was, was done in the past. And I think that's the change that the tone of it is really about doing it right and making sure that it's done from the ground up. So making sure that not only the systems are in place, but the recruitment is in place and the policies are in place. And so, uh, you know, that's what we're seeing, people who are really invested in this. And it's because of these stories, it's because they get to really understand the history of our community and the barriers that we've faced um, that wouldn't have happened without movies like Disclosure. Um, and I think that's that's really the beauty uh, of what I'm seeing that, you know, we're seeing a lot more allies uh, uh, want to do this right. And I think that's what was missing in the past. People were doing it very um, on the surface, like, yeah, yeah, we're diverse um, and we'll hire a couple of trans people in there. We've done it. Check the box. We're done. And now people are really, you know, wanting to include trans people at all levels. Um, and that's been really transformative and has allowed us to create mentorship programs within these companies because they also understand the story that, uh, you know, trans people, because of the violence we experience, don't get the opportunities that many other people do um, and therefore don't have access. And so uh, also being willing to develop training programs to bring people in, to teach them the skill and to be able to then bring them on board. Um, and so, you know, I think we see companies really uh, wanting to do it right. And that's been transformative and is so inspiring. Laverne, I want to toss this quick over to you before we start trying to get into some Q&A, because we've gotten some and they're really good. Um, and, you know, you've been on sets, you've been doing this work. I mean, this is while, you know, I think we all saw when um, Transparent was on the ways in which uh, the work there was centered and starting in this way, um, but this film itself, but what can the industry learn from this? I mean, from your own personal experience and, and ways in which uh, you would love to see it change and evolve too. One big thing I think is that, you know, Sam tells me that in the beginning when we would go, we, we, we may have put he and, um, Amy were approaching investors, they would say, well, you know, yeah, it's great that you want to hire trans people, but we should hire the best people. And we did hire the best people and they happen to be <laughs> mostly trans people. And I think if the industry can begin to understand that, that we, um, we are the best people to tell our stories. I think that if we can really sort of get that across and that there's so much talent, I just think about so many moments in my in, in my career over the years. I mean, I, I'm, I've been at this for a really long time. And for a long time, you'd hear directors say, well, there aren't any trans actors, you know? And there would be so many, I would be like, well, I'm here, I'm right here. And I, at the time, for years, I didn't have an agent and I couldn't get in a room for an audition. And people just sort of assumed that we didn't exist or that we, if we did, that we weren't qualified to do the job. And I, you just can't, you can't say that anymore. This film proves it. The work of so many wonderful um, folks who are in our film and, and, and not in our film is proving that. And I think that it shows that anything is possible, really, and that you can hire people who maybe don't have all of the experience that you think they would have, but they can, um, with some guidance and with some vision, you can make a really compelling, amazing, 
wonderful film that can change hearts and minds, that can move people, make them laugh, make them cry, and get everything that you want from the work. And it's not a compromise to hire, to hire us. It is actually um, to your benefit to hire us. That's amazing. Thank you so much for framing it in that way. It's just such a beautiful way to put it. Um, you know, uh, we've gotten a lot of questions, so I, I'm going to give us two extra minutes on them because they're going to flow into some great conversations. So we're going to open it up. Um, again, if you have uh, questions, you can, um, if I can find the piece of paper again, go to arts at weho.org and you can submit those. Um, and this first question uh, actually leads in into what was going to be my last question to you, Sam, but specifically, um, you know, I wanna make sure we're centering this conversation is, you know, I myself am a white cisgender gay man. I stand as an ally to this community and to all communities and how I continue to uplift this work, but how we in West Hollywood being very predominantly white, um, you know, gay male centric, all of these things and how we own this privilege, how we make sure we're using this privilege to to be an ally, but specifically, how do we go outside of our little 1.89 square miles of West Hollywood? Um, I do sometimes, um, but how do we get this film into the, um, the hands, the virtual hands, whatever you want to call it, these phone things that we have um, into places like where I'm from. Um, I'm from Ripon, Wisconsin. It's the birthplace of the Republican party, right? So, you know, uh, and, and just if anyone's watching from Ripon, there are LGBTQ people there. So FYI, um, you know, but ultimately, how do you get this film into universities, colleges, places where it's needed so much? And have you started to do that? And if, uh, and if not, what's the plan to do that? That's a great question. Um, you know, we premiered literally a year ago, January 27th uh, at Sundance. Oh, wow. and oh really? Oh, well, happy anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Wow, wow. And you know, we were, it was, in an incredible reception. We were getting great critical reviews. We were off, we were ready. We were getting off to the races. Uh, we rolled up our sleeves, ready to travel around the world, go to different festivals. And then we all know what happened, right? The world completely shut down. And we didn't know what was, what was gonna happen with this film. Would anyone ever see it? And then, you know, we, we knew our ultimate dream was to be on Netflix, but we thought, you know, we wanna do this festival thing. You know, it's glamorous, it's fun, you make connections. Um, and so we were heartbroken to not be able to do that. But then when it landed on Netflix and we started hearing from people all over the globe in a way we never would have before. Yeah. I mean, that it was so heartening to, to see that happen in real time so quickly. And so many people that got to see it on Netflix might not have been able to afford a ticket to a film festival, right? Those tickets can be 25 bucks, 30 bucks. So, you know, either you can get your friends, you know, sorry, Netflix, but you can get your friends log in, you know, or you pay your seven, $8 a month. But having, you know, having it on this streaming platform that has, I don't know, a reach of 190 million people around the world, that's how you reach, you know, kids where you grew up, right? That's how you reach kids in, you know, towns we don't even know exist. So that's been incredible and um within within days i was starting to visit classrooms and and talk about the film and again it's available to everyone you know and and netflix has been incredibly generous with allowing us to provide the film uh, to students who might not have access to to netflix so it's it's been a great partnership and it's more than we dreamed that's amazing um you know it's funny because we all live by our phones these days or Zoom or whatever it is. Um, happy one year anniversary, that's incredible. That's kismet, that's exactly what, you know, that's when you know, those are, that's a sign from the goddess, you're on the right path. So we're gonna continue this path, um, you know, and, and specifically talk about, you know, the depictions that we're all not the same in this in this movie. We're all different, but you know, I the, the conversation around Caitlyn Jenner um, has been centered in the ways in which different experiences, obviously different privileges, and coming from a different privilege of, of whiteness, I believe, as Janet Mock uh, in the film really and how she breaks it down. Um, but the question itself is: is how do you bridge the void between access of being allowed to be who we are? and those who still fear walking um, out the door being their true self. And I'm gonna to toss this up to anyone that wants to, wants to take it on uh, um, and, and answer it. Well, I'll, 
I mean, the reality is that it is still, still no matter who you are, it is still dangerous to be trans in public. And that is something I've never forgotten. I was reminded of it recently um, when something happened last year. It's not safe to be trans in public and even in lovely places like Los Angeles. Um, and so we have to do everything we can to stay safe, you know, and and to hopefully protect ourselves and to protect each other within the mindsets of the people who would harm us that we have to get underneath that and we have to change those minds and those hearts of the people who would 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 harm us and that is a, that's an uphill battle those people are, are are very far gone sometimes when you've got when you've gone so far as to sort of you know physically harm someone that that that's a that's some stuff that we have to really address. Um, but I think it, a lot, I think about parents, I think about parents and what they tell and teach their children. I think a lot about um, most of this violence is happening from men, cisgender men, what are we teaching our sons um, of all races? And that's where the interventions have to happen. And then I think for adult men, um, adult, adults of all gender identities, we. It's, it should not be, your life should not be in danger for walking down the street as a trans person. And unfortunately it still is. And that, I, that reality is constantly devastating for me. And I, um, with the platform that I've had for all of these years, that 2020 is the deadliest year on record, the most violent year on record for trans people is the year that this film comes out. It's like, I just feel at a loss. Um, Drianne and uh, Alexis, how, in the, what do you think, I, I, I don't even, I don't even know what to do, you know, really, I, 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 my work is to sort of do things like disclosure and to try to raise awareness and change hearts and minds, but on, on a day-to-day -day basis, what, what can we do when we know jobs and, and housing and all those things, but like, you know, the thing that happened being, I mean, you, just, you don't even have to be homeless to like, just have somebody decide one day that they're going to just attack you. What, um, what, what do you, what do we do? And, and you know, Laverne, it definitely can feel so daunting and overwhelming. And it feels like we've made so many strides forward, but then it feels like you're taken right back to having no rights and no protection um, often. And, you know, um, for us, what's really critical is part of getting people jobs is creating a safe space for, for our community when they come into those jobs. And so training for us becomes a big part of the work that we do. And not only to help companies develop those policies to be able to address the microaggressions and the potential violence that happens, but also to identi identify those allies, those people who all they needed was the language to be able to address transphobic instances. All they needed was to, give in the, to be given the encouragement to say, you you can step in and stop that. You can be a good ally and educate your, your cis colleague on how to interact with trans people. And I think that that's part of the work that it, it feels overwhelming to do it ourselves. But when we bring in our allies, they're the ones who can start chipping away at that. They're the ones who bring those conversations home with them and talk about these things. And when it's your aunt, your mother, your grandmother, who's talking about trans issues, that changes the whole conversation and makes it accessible to, to people who maybe weren't able to hear the message before. And so, you know, I think for us, a part of it is, is education and allyship, locating those allies, encouraging them to speak up and, and building their numbers. So then the people who discriminate against us feel like the minority. Um, and, you know, that, that's the work, that's the work we're doing now. Alexis, I want to, my, my fellow uh, float writer uh, a couple prides ago, I know you have a lot to say about this, but I want to turn it over to you too, because this is such something I know you center your activism in. Yeah, absolutely. I think, and the film points this out as well, right? Visibility is a double-edged sword. I think there are people that didn't know that trans people existed as of a decade ago, who all of a sudden with more anti-trans legislation trying to be passed with more, with trans people gaining more prominence, they've decided that they have a burning hatred towards trans people that they have to express sometimes verbally and sometimes physically. Um, so it's led to it just getting scarier and scarier right out there. 
I think we've seen, um, again, an intersection of all sorts of violence. We've seen a rise in hate crimes across the spectrum. But I think one of the most powerful things is empowering allies to to do those interventions and to do those to help de-escalate situations to literally put their bodies on the line for less marginalized for more marginalized communities right i think um one of the things that post 9 11 we started to see a lot of incidences of islamophobia and one of the things that we asked community members was to show up for for our community to show up for the people that were being harassed and to put ourselves between uh, the harasser and the person that's being harassed. So I think if allies really want to show up big, that's what we need right now. We need people literally put, putting their bodies between ours and between the person who's seeking to do us harm. Um, thank you so much, Alexis. That's such an important point. And, um, and if you can actually believe it, it is almost six o'clock. And so we are pretty much out of time, but I'm going to leave it with this statement as we wrap up here that we got in, um, that was emailed into us from one of our viewers. And it's this, my father hasn't spoken to me in three years since I transitioned. He saw your film and called me and admitted so much of his bias was based on negative portrayals of trans people on film and TV. We um, cried together and he's coming out to visit me in LA at last. Thank uh, you. You know, this is the type of, of moment and mm. space that we just sit in and, you know, mm. Sam, Laverne, Drian, Alexis, um, the work that you do is revolutionary, but the work that you do is to make the world a better place. Um, it is to make sure that we're all centered in equality, that we're all centered in justice for all, and that no matter who we are or where we come from, or how we identify that if you're um, uh, in, in threat, uh, I will stand and put my body in line for you. Um, I, and I know that when we all work together that you would do the same for any one of us. And on behalf of the city of West Hollywood, I wanna thank Sam, you for making this film. You are a hero. Laverne, you are a trailblazer. I, I stand, as the Gen Xers say, as my, my young staff tells me every day. Um, uh, um, Drian, Alexis, you are two dear friends who I just have so much love and respect for. Um, and I wanna make sure that um, those who are watching, um, the city of West Hollywood always will stand and does stand with the transgender and LGBTQIA plus community. Um, that is exactly who we are. That is exactly what we always will do. That is why the city is going to be the first city in the nation um, to be installing the transgender flag along Santa Monica Boulevard. Um, we approved that a few weeks, uh, a few months ago, but also making sure our beautiful community is inclusive to all by updating our rainbow flags, but by making sure that no matter who you are, where you are, or no matter what goes on, that West Hollywood is home for you. And, and with that, I wanna bid you all adieu. And I wanna thank each and every one of you for tuning in tonight and for participating in this amazing discussion. And I can't wait to see you get that Oscar, Sam. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Speak it into existence. Thank you so I'm much. I'm saying it. We're, if, if we say it, it will come. So thank you all. Um, uh, good night. Please stay safe and healthy. And we'll see you next time. Thank you, John. Uh, thanks so Great. much. Thank you.